Thank you, Gary. And what we want to thank GSC Consulting uh, again for their support throughout all the years. Um, we've known Gary for a long, long time, and uh, he's just a terrific friend and colleague. Uh, we have a, a very innovative session here for you. Um, what we've got are three innovative technologies that are just stepping into the marketplace. Our first speaker is going to be, needs no introduction, uh, John Lantis. Uh, I've known John for uh, 35 years. Um, he's a vascular surgeon. He's a professor and vice chairman uh, of the surgery department at Mount Sinai in New York City. Uh, he's a football player. He's a, a terrific guy, a wonderful speaker, uh, and he'll be our first speaker. And uh, can John please come up? Thank you, Oscar, very much. I uh, always am humbled to be here. I look at you guys as the brains, and I'm the muscle. Uh, and that's basically what I provide. That's what we're talking about today. One of the things uh, that we don't do enough, we all know this, this is very simplistic. I'm not going to talk about changing the genomics. I'm not going to change, talk about recruiting stem cells. I'm not going to talk about uh, making mRNA synthase uh, modulators. Uh, none of that. I'm going to be like, let's remove the junk that's on the wounds that don't allow the wounds to do well. Grace going to talk later about what that junk is. I'm not even sure what it is. But with that, um, and I put up uh, Callie here. Dr. Horn is our fellow this year. She'll have a poster tonight that goes into a little bit of the science of this. So this is going to be the concept. And a little bit of the data we've started to get so far will be presented later this evening. And I do not want to steal her thunder. So, you know, the device purpose we're talking about here is a, a tool, if you will, that potentially could make uh, the breedment uh, easier, uh, cleaning easier uh, for not just the experts who might be here in the audience, but also home care providers, other people, folks with differing uh, skill sets, and to try to modulate uh, you know, or improve the number of patients who also have access to this, because it, uh, th this technology has the potential to decrease the pain of mechanical or you know, the touching the patient debridement, if you will. So the possibility of better wound bed prep prior to uh, tissue grafting, which is a place we've used it so far, a better step or uh, of treatment to remove material from the wound on a frequent basis that might uh, reduce biofilm at a short term and then be able to do it on a weekly basis, et cetera. Less pain with debridement, which we have some data on. Less hassle than other, uh, you know, that's a technical term, hassle, uh, other than advanced other modalities. But we use a lot of mechanical modalities currently, um, and some of them really aren't uh, correct for the office, such as uh, tangential hydrosurgery, which we love in the operating room, but that's not something you're going to do weekly. Um, we have, we uh, have access to the ultrasound technologies, et cetera. We'll talk about this. And then cost effectiveness. This is just a very simple, very simple tool. Um, I just had to I'd say this is, this is a lunchtime story, but a brief one. So I spent a lot of DARPA money when I was a fellow in, in uh, residency on developing a four step that you could feed with a laser. And I have a patent on it. And you know what? You can take a four step and you can feed it with it. Battery, and this thing's battery driven, not laser driven. So it's not sexy, but it works. Same as yeah. After a half a million dollars, I was like, yo. By the way, we could do this with a battery. So much for the laser technology. But the Air Force felt good. Anyway, um, the idea, of the innovation, as Gary pointed out, you know, he uh, works with a lot of companies, and you're going to hear more stuff in the next uh, hour in regards to innovative technology, things that are maybe out of the box or different from the box. One of the issues with mechanical debriding uh, modalities we have now, they're actually relatively expensive. And there's not a great uh, reimbursement strategy to increase uh, your reimbursement for debriding. So your $4 curette or your reusable curette might be the most cost-effective thing for you, but it might not be the best thing to use. So idea here would be to have a, a low-cost uh, uh, idea. Very easy cleanup. You don't want to have a room down when, you know, we've talked about busy clinics a little bit here. You've heard from Heal Logics and about their volume. You can only imagine day to day in a clinic, you don't have time for a room to be down for 30 minutes to clean it or do something or prep a tool, et cetera. Um, no excess material. You're not going to create a lot of environmental hazard by having all these things you have to throw out. Then we all know that uh, the modalities for debridement that we currently have don't really address pain as an issue. And, and the issues of topical anesthetic might be uh, something we can talk about in the future, but I won't bring that up too much now. Uh, and then the idea here is that more people could do debridement or more patients who right now don't allow you to debride because of pain 
once they've experienced this, we actually have anecdotal stuff. And again, Dr. Horn will talk about this this evening a bit, that we have patients who don't usually allow debridement who now, because we're using this tool, actually allow us to debride uh, with that tool. And this is a, you know, this is a, a little bit more on the commercial side of these slides, and this is certainly uh, something that uh, about, but we all know that biofilm and bacteria in general to combat them. And one of the things that we do know that works, and Greg's done a huge amount of work in this area, and I've occasionally been allowed to help him, um, but with that in mind is recurrent debridement is one way to reduce the bacterial burden, get a wound compared, and we know it you know, again, might not be changing the mRNA, might not be changing the M1 macrophages, the M2 macrophages, and everything else that you guys know so much about, but it is, does help the wounds get smaller quicker. So what we want to do is that, since we know so many of these wounds have these problems, we want to be able to remove that material on a frequent basis, and we do know that in sort of big data, as we're talking about without any artificial intelligence, the big data, that uh, the folks who get debrided more quickly, maybe they're more compliant, maybe it's a marker for other things, maybe they're genetically better, I don't know. But if you debride them quicker or more frequently, they often get better faster. So the general premise here is a more aggressive removal of biofilm, we know these are 3D structures that require mechanical debridement. They regrow quickly, and you want to do this serially. You need to have some method. So this this tool, and we're not, we haven't really used it this way, but we'll talk about the tool in a second. But the tool also has maybe the ability to have a cleansing head and a debriding head, sort of different modalities. It's sort of like if you have a soft toothbrush versus a hard toothbrush to some degree. Uh, what type of tool are you going to use? And uh, there might be uh, settings where home care and other people, folks in a nursing home, etc., could use one of the lesser tools, but get some benefit out of that as well. Yet to be fully determined. So uh, here we see what we have on the on your left hand side. Uh, you know the things that we sort of have in the office available to us at the moment: uh, the Sonic, Sonic One, Sanuay, the Ultramist, which Ultramist has a huge amount of data. I have to just probably say that it's impressive if you actually do a data review on these technologies. Uh, they did a lot of work on this, whether you use it or not. And then the stuff we use standardly on the right-hand side, the sharp excisional debridement, uh, which is handy uh, to have, usually causes some amount of pain. You have to worry about hemostasis, et cetera. But these are sort of our current options. And I did not put, uh, first it's just not here because it's not an office-based modality that you're going to have available to you. So the idea here, now you know, the, the grand, grand unveiling, if you will, the standard of care on the left-hand side, cold, sharp, surgical steel, usually associated with some amount of fear factor when you come at the patient with it, kind of hide it behind, you know, kind of like a, a, a matador, you walk up and you hide it behind your cape and you kind of, oh, I'm just going to clean this up for you a little bit, you're not going to notice anything. And, and uh, don't, don't look, don't you like to lay flat? We're going to put you prone. Uh, you know, so all these things that you do to try to avoid the patient seeing what you're coming at them with. First is on the right-hand side, this device, and this is actually an artist rendering of the commercial device. It's not the one we're using currently, but fundamentally a tool that's battery-driven, and we'll get into the, uh, the specifics of that momentarily. But the idea here is this tool uses vibratory analgesia, which there's a large amount of work written about. And certainly in medical school, I always thought that this was a gate hypothesis of pain. And, you know, you sprain your ankle and you rub your knee and your foot feels better because you're distracting yourself, etc. Well, that, this paper shows that that's probably not the case. This stuff is all actually cortically mediated. But there's a bunch of research that shows that with vibration, some of the pressure and other uh, sensations that you might feel that you associate with pain are modulated. So the idea here is that hi, having a subsonic frequency that this device is modulating back and forth, not only are you able to uh, potentially distract the tissue and change with it, the biofilm adhesion, but you decrease the actual pain that the patient experiences. And they're more readily available to have you breathe them again and again. So, handheld cordless device, sub-ultrasonic frequency, will eventually work on uh, two uh, AAA batteries. Therefore, it will be able to pass the FDA cleansing and reprocessing validation process, which is a fairly lengthy process and has to have a cleansing and a sterilization process. I'm not going to go deep into that, but it, it, it's going to be designed to do that. And at the moment, we'll have three different heads. The current iteration looks like what we have on the right-hand side, and this is what we've been using in the clinic. Um, it has got a sleeve on it that you throw out, the head you throw out, and that head is hard plastic with a uh, curette on the end of it, so you can do uh, curettage, sharp curettage for billing purposes. 
And the uh, rendition of the uh, commercially available product is over here. The current product has a rechargeable battery uh, that's nice in the clinic, but that's going to change in, uh, in design due to the uh, cleansing and reprocessing stuff. Of note, the way it's going to work is you're going to have these three heads, uh, as you see at the bottom, uh, in right, the bottom right, if you will, that's going to be the cleansing head. That's a gentler head with sort of undulating plastic um, um, modulation uh, system through it and probably thought to be more useful for home care or nursing care. And you can use this with irrigation. Currently, we're using this with irrigation that is, uh, that, you know, is, is not coaxial completely, that we just irrigate from the side using an aliquot, etc., but these can be built to, to put a uh, syringe directly on the back of it. Then there's a small head for those smaller wounds uh, with a fairly aggressive plastic, and we've done some work uh, with uh, Dr. Farrell, who's developing this and who's, who you know, has, has put this in the market, um, looking at the metal heads versus the plastic heads, and we've actually found the plastic head to be very useful, and you don't need the metal component of that head. So you have the small head and the large heads as will be commercialized. And this gives you an idea of the scrubbing head and what it looks like. Um, that's the uh, more gentle head that can be used for cleansing. And then the more aggressive heads, just, to, you know, sort of, they look like the bottom. Uh, Oscar alluded to my football history. They look like the bottom of a Nike Shark football shoe, actually. It was a small one and a big one. My son now wears 13, so those were really big football shoes. But anyway, um, they're pretty aggressive. And you can, uh, with pressure and motion, you can modulate how they go. Uh, you see the schematic of how this is going to work. And currently, at the bottom on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see, I'm sorry, bottom on the right-hand side, you'll see that we you can use irrigation. There's a possibility of using gels and analgesia gels. In the future, uh, it's a single vibrational system that is started, initiated by a button. It has haptic and uh, sensory feedback. You, you feel it at the same time. The patient knows it's going on. Uh, they comment on it. Most everybody says, oh, it's like a... It's like a Sonic One toothbrush. I mean, that's what everybody says. It's the, and you kind of can explain it to patients. They almost all get that premise, and uh, it's sort of the same technology. So, with that in mind, this is just us obviously using uh, immunofluorescent or uh, uh, fluorescence uh, imaging to take a look at trying to figure out how to debris a tissue a wound bed in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis prior to application of a uh, living cellular substrate. Uh, she's had previous uh, tendon exposure, and you can see on the left-hand side, we started with this. We got her over to that, and for uh, time purposes, I didn't keep on going. So I'm not trying to steal uh, any thunder tonight from, uh, from uh, Dr. Horn, who will present some of the data we've collected, but in general, our experience to date has uh, started to uh, repro I won't say validate, that's a big term, but reproduce the fact that patients uh, on, on total on moss complain of less pain. Uh, these are, uh, therefore, they tolerate debridement more frequently. Um, it is actually faster for us in most cases for larger wounds. The larger the wound, the faster this is compared to going after it with a forcep or a curette. So for a patient with a 40 centimeter uh, status post transmetatarsal amputation, for example, who's granulated and we want to put a skin substitute on it, uh, this makes cleaning that up a lot quicker than just trying to pick at it and get it cleaned, which we do, but we, we can go a lot faster. Uh, so we find it very useful prior to a CTP placement, which, of course, is the center we do a lot of. Uh, currently, we've uh, got a grant application in to look at the efficacy of this uh, with, uh, a, with uh, a topical antimicrobial or in comparison to it, with and in comparison to that same topical antimicrobial. So that's currently in, in the works. So I'd uh, like to thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Wade Farrell is the inventor of this. He's in the back. And Dr. Horn will be presenting her data tonight. And no further ado.